In 2008, the Italian vascular surgeon Dr. Paolo Zamboni shocked the world by claiming that multiple sclerosis could be related to abnormalities in the veins draining the brain and spinal cord, and he proposed liberation therapy or mechanical correction of these venous abnormalities as a potential treatment or even cure of multiple sclerosis. Today, I'm going to review this very controversial research, some of the theoretical evidence behind this claim, and the scientific objections to it, along with two published randomized trials for liberation therapy, and my own personal experiences, and I have some timestamps if you want to skip ahead. Let's have some fun. Now, I should say, as a conflict of interest statement, that I'm potentially biased against CCSVI just because I'm a traditionally trained neurologist. And when it first came out, all of my mentors and colleagues were essentially against it right away, and they were highly skeptical. But I'll try to be as fair as possible, and you can be the judge as to my credibility. And by the way, I'm Brandon Bieber. I make videos about multiple sclerosis every Wednesday, so please subscribe and ring the bell for notifications. And if you enjoyed this video, please click like. Now, this story starts when Dr. Paolo Zamboni found found out that his mother had multiple sclerosis and he wanted to research more into it. And he learned what has been known for more than a hundred years, which is that inflammation in the brain in MS develops primarily around the veins, specifically around the post-capillary venules as the small veins start to form as the capillary beds end. Indeed, we can actually see the central venule on imaging studies. It's most easily seen on 7 Tesla MRI, which is used primarily for research purposes, but in this case, you can see it's seen even on a three Tesla flare sagittal MRI in a 30 year old woman with MS. You can clearly see the central flow void within the lesions, which is an artifact caused by the movement of blood flow in the venule by the MRI scan. And even on biopsy and autopsy, we can see the abnormal inflammation, in this case, a lymphocytic infiltrate around the central venule. And Dr. Zamboni started looking for abnormalities in people's veins who had MS. MS, and he would find abnormalities such as the stenosis or narrowing in the jugular vein. Now, there are different ways to look at the veins. You could do ultrasound, you could do something called MR venography, but this is a catheter angiogram where their catheter is introduced into the veins and wired up into the relevant veins and dye is injected, and then a computer does something called digital subtraction angiography to create an image of the vein, and this is the gold standard, and it's also how you would do an intervention on the veins. So the theory is that these larger veins drain the complex venous system within the brain and spinal cord. So for instance, within the brain, these veins all drain down to the jugular veins. This is the superior sagittal sinus going into the confluence of sinuses and the straight transverse sinus, and then into the sigmoid sinus and into the internal jugular veins. And you have other veins in the chest, like the azagous vein draining the spinal cord. And the idea is you could do procedures called liberation therapy to open up these veins. And you could do angioplasty, which is dilating a balloon to open up a stenosis or narrowing, or you could put in a stent. And these procedures were reported to be relatively safe with a low risk of side effects, although there were rare reports of serious side effects, such as the migration of a stent towards the heart. So while neurologists had believed for decades that the primary abnormality in MS was the immune system, which was confused and inappropriately attacking the central nervous system, Dr. Zamboni believed that the primary abnormality could be the veins causing venous congestion and a damage to the blood-brain barrier causing extravasation of blood products such as red blood cells and other components of the plasma causing irritation of the central nervous system and an inflammatory reaction. In other words, the inflammation could be secondary to a problem with the veins. And the evidence of CCSVI could be summarized as follows. One, of course, is the central venule in the lesions. We also see that there are deposits of iron in MS lesions, and we also know that blood flow or perfusion of the brain in MS tends to be reduced overall, possibly because there's poor drainage from the veins. Also, in one mouse model of MS known as experimental autoimmune encephalomyelitis, there's evidence that injury to the myelin or the fatty sheath of the nerve fibers may occur prior to immune cell invasion. In other words, the, the myelin injury occurs before the immune cells even get there. Of course, this is only in animal studies. Also, once Dr. Zamboni 
Zamboni reported these findings, people were having these procedures done and some were reporting tremendous improvements, sometimes immediately after the procedure. And to this day, you can go on YouTube and search CCSVI before after videos and see people videotaping themselves before and after the procedures. And some people reported an improvement, although it was all anecdotal. Now here are the data from Dr. Zamboni's landmark study where he looked at CCSVI or chronic cerebrospinal venous insufficiency and he defined this as having two or more abnormal findings in the veins that drain the brain and spinal cord. And he used Doppler ultrasound and looked at 109 people with MS and sure enough all of them, 109 out of 109, or 100% met this criteria for CCSVI, whereas none, literally zero out of 177 of the control population met this criteria. So CCSVI, as he defined it, perfectly discriminated between multiple sclerosis and not multiple sclerosis. He went on to define a more complicated criteria known as venous hemodynamic insufficiency severity score, which he used in future research. But neurologists were incredibly skeptical of his findings. And one of my colleagues reported to me when the data was on the previous slide was shown at a professional conference, the audience literally laughed out loud because they could just not believe these findings at all. Now the credibility of clinical research is ultimately determined by repeatability. Can other investigators repeat and either confirm or refute your findings? And many people sought to do this, some reporting a correlation between CCSVI and MS and others reporting no correlation. But one notable researcher, Dr. Robert Zavadinov, did note a correlation between CCSVI and MS. He found CCSVI in 56.1% of people with MS versus only 42.3% of people with other neurological disorders such as peripheral neuropathy or Parkinson's disease and only 22.7% of healthy controls. He also noted a 38.1% prevalence in people with clinically isolated syndrome, which is sort of a precursor to multiple sclerosis. So there was a correlation here, but not nearly as strong as what was reported by Dr. Zamboni. But this did prompt him to do further research, as we'll discuss later. Now, in the meantime, neurologists were very skeptical of CCSVI, and arguably they had good reason to be because there are many theoretical arguments against it. For instance, the central venule isn't really unique to multiple sclerosis. It can also be seen in other diseases of the nervous system. One example is Bichette's disease, which is an autoimmune disease that can cause central nervous system lesions, but can also cause aseptic meningitis and mouth and genital ulcers and lesions of the skin. It's more common in Mediterranean countries, and it actually responds to TNF-alpha blocking agents, which make multiple sclerosis worse. And as you can see on this MRI scan, it can be associated with a central venule. This is also true of primary angiitis of the central nervous system, which is a vasculitis or inflammation of the blood vessels. Also, there are diseases that are known to occur in the veins of the central nervous system that don't cause MS. One example is this CAT scan with contrast to the left, which shows a thrombus or clot in the right transverse sinus. This is a disease that can cause stroke and hemorrhage, and it definitely increases pressure in the veins of the central nervous system, but it's not associated with MS at all. Why not? Also, there's a disease known as superior vena cava syndrome. The superior vena cava is the large vein that drains blood from the upper body into the heart. And you can see, for instance, on this CAT scan of the chest, there's a thrombus associated with an indwelling catheter blocking the superior vena cava. And on the left, there's a tumor obstructing the superior cana vena cava. And this disease can cause things like swelling of the face and the arms and shortness of breath, but it's not linked to MS despite increasing the pressure of veins in the central nervous system. Why doesn't it increase the risk of MS or cause a similar disease? Another thing is that the genetics of MS suggests that it is an autoimmune disease. This is a graph looking at all of the genetic polymorphisms, or I should say many of the genetic polymorphisms associated with MS, and virtually all of them have something to do with the immune system. For example, the gene most associated with MS is HLA-DRB1-1501. If you have two abnormal copies of this allele, it confers an eight-fold increased risk of MS, why don't we see more genes related to vascular disease linked to MS if it's primarily a venous disease? Also, we know a lot of the treatments for MS are highly effective.
For instance, this is a study on hematopoietic stem cell transplant done in Sweden on aggressive relapsing MS, and you can see that the MRI event-free survival drops off considerably, even up to 120 months. I have a separate video on hematopoietic stem cell transplant if you want to take a look, but basically it works by ablating the entire immune system, but the immune system comes back over time, but why would it continue to have a benefit if it isn't solving the underlying problem of venous congestion? Also, the overall epidemiology of MS correlates more with autoimmune diseases. It's more common in younger people. The median age of diagnosis is 30, which would be unusual for vascular diseases. And it's more common in women, which is typical of autoimmune diseases. And it often goes into remission spontaneously during pregnancy, also typical of autoimmune diseases. Also, the imaging of veins is notoriously fickle. We know that the diameter of veins varies tremendously during the day and with hydration status. One study showed that even giving intravenous fluids can reverse CCSVI in many cases. And one theory is that people with MS, because they often have neurogenic bladder and have to urinate more frequently, they may subconsciously drink less water, so they're slightly dehydrated, which could bias the diagnosis of CCSVI, so it may be more of a secondary phenomenon. So does liberation therapy actually work? Perhaps we can answer this question with randomized trials. And now we have Dr. Robert Zavadnoff rising from the dead, and he published a study called the Prospective Randomized Trial of Venous Angioplasty in MS, or the PREMISE study. And this was the first randomized study actually published on the subject, even though thousands of these procedures had already been done. And this was a phase two trial of venous angioplasty, and there were only 19 patients. 10 received the sham or fake procedure, so they thought they were getting the treatment, but they weren't, and nine were actually treated with angioplasty to open up their veins. And the primary outcome was MRI lesions, and they did MRI scans one month afterwards, three months afterwards, and six months afterwards, and there were no complications of the procedure. There was actually one patient in the treatment group that did have bradycardia, or a slow heart rate, and actually required a pacemaker, although they felt it was unrelated to the procedure, and they kind of just discovered it on accident while the patient was being evaluated. Now, that being said, the treatment didn't actually seem to work. In fact, there was a trend favoring more lesions, more active lesions, and more T2 lesions in the treatment group. So the treatment group actually did slightly worse, although not to a statistically significant degree. However, critics of the study noted that they weren't very effective at actually opening up the veins. If you look at the phase one study, which is sort of the preliminary open label study before this trial, you can see that in green, they achieved a reduction in the VHISS, or venous hemodynamic insufficiency severity score. So the veins sort of got better. But in the randomized trial, if you look at the placebo group in red and the treatment group in blue, they ended up being about the same with no statistically significant difference. So for whatever reason, the procedure wasn't very effective at actually opening up the veins, and perhaps that's why it didn't work. So Dr. Zamboni wanted to take things into his own hands, and he published a larger study called the Brave Dreams Trial, published in 2017. And this had 111 participants compared to only 19, ages 18 to 65, and they all had relapsing remitting MS. And this was a double-blind sham controlled trial in six different MS centers in Italy. And the average EDS which is a measure of disability in MS, and I have a separate video on this topic if you want to take a look, was 2.6 in the treatment group and 2.7 in the sham group. The mean age was 40 in the treatment group versus 37.5 in the sham group, and it was 2 to 1 randomization. In other words, two-thirds of the patients got their real treatment, and one-third got the fake treatment. Now, interestingly in this study, about a quarter of the patients didn't meet Dr. Zamboni's criteria for CCSVI, so he sort of refuted his own original findings in 2008, which suggested that everyone with MS had CCSVI. In this study, only about 74% met the 
entrance criteria. And the primary outcome they used was a combined measurement of five functional indexes, walking, balance, manual dexterity, bladder control, and visual acuity. And they also looked at new lesions on the MRI. Now, again, the study was negative. There was no difference between the treatment group and the controls in the primary outcomes, which was the functional outcomes. However, if you looked at the MRI results, there was a trend towards the patients being treated doing a little bit better. For instance, amongst the treated patients, 63% had no new lesions versus only 49% in the sham group. Now, this was not statistically significant. However, later they published a post hoc analysis of Brave Dreams, and they looked at people with particular characteristics on angiography, and they thought they could identify people with so-called favorable angiography characteristics who might be more likely to benefit from the treatment. And sure enough, those with these favorable angiography characteristics whose veins had a certain look to them tended to do better. For instance, if you look at the center graph, you can see people who had a percutaneous angiography favorable characteristics versus unfavorable. And the blue is people who did not have lesions, and the yellow is people who did have new lesions. And you can see if you look at those with unfavorable characteristics, they didn't do particularly well. Most had new lesions, very similar to the sham group. But if you looked at those who had favorable characteristics, most of them did not have new lesions, and this compares very favorably to the sham group. Now, if you look to the left, there is a statistically significant difference overall versus the treatment and sham group, which is different from the original published data in 2017. I have no idea why. If anyone can answer this, please post in the comments below. So as a result of this, neurologists were like, okay, we're done, two negative trials, stop asking us questions about this. However, some people disagree and still think CCSVI could be of some importance. For instance, this is Dr. Rassman, who published an opinion article in a vascular surgery journal, and he says, quote, from Brave Dreams post hoc analysis, younger individuals with transverse endoluminal defects and higher pre-PTA flows are more likely to respond well to PTA or percutaneous angioplasty compared to those who exhibit hypoplasia, stenosis, or longitudinal endoluminal defects. Therefore, in my opinion, the intervention for CCSVI may still have a role in carefully selected cases. So, of course, the next step would be to do a new trial selecting only those with the best angiography characteristics and see if they would respond to the treatment in a randomized trial. And I actually contacted Dr. Zamboni and asked if he would consider this, and he said he would be interested in it, but the neurology community just wasn't supportive and was too antagonistic, so perhaps it is unfeasible. So what is my take on the whole CCSBI and liberation therapy saga? Well, I have seen some patients who have had the procedure over the years. I remember back in 2009 and 2010 where virtually every patient was asking about it. And I have had some patients who underwent the procedure. To be honest, I haven't seen anything particularly impressive. And certainly I've seen some people who were worse years after having the procedure, though there could be a bias where people who do well sort of give up on neurologists and stop following following up. Now I have to say my opinion is that Zamboni's original idea that he had sort of found the cause of MS, that we were looking in the wrong direction and these abnormalities in the veins were universally present and were the cause of MS, to me that has essentially been refuted. It would have been much easier to replicate the correlation between venous anomalies and MS. It's just not possible in my view that other researchers wouldn't be able to confirm that easily and confirm a very strong correlation. Now, the idea that CCSVI or venous congestion in the brain could be a local factor contributing to worsening of MS or even part of the cause of MS, that is certainly still possible. A lot of doctors are very skeptical of any kind of subgroup analysis of a clinical trial or a post hoc analysis, but in my view is that if it makes theoretical sense, I would definitely consider it. That being said, my view is that if it works, it's going to work in a sham controlled randomized trial and someone should be able to prove it. Are there enough resources and interest to actually get a new trial on this specific subgroup? I don't know. We may never find out. I'd be interested to know, have any of you undergone liberation therapy and what are your results? And do you have any other suggestions for future videos?